Good morning. Good morning. And uh, greetings and welcome to all of you who are worshiping with us here in this sanctuary in what I call the Lighthouse Church on Hunter Avenue. And greetings to all of you who are worshiping with us in a different realm, whether it's on Zoom or Facebook or YouTube, or even if you have an extrasensory perception and worshiping with us in the fourth dimension of space, uh, we welcome you as well. And we call it the Lighthouse Church on Hunter. Uh, and so if sometimes you feel like you're at sea and adrift and uh, need to find shore, well, perhaps you would like to join with us here on a Sunday morning, and uh, I think you'll be welcomed, and uh, probably you'll feel like you already belong here. So good morning and greetings. We didn't plan this, by the way. <laughs> Please stand for the call to worship. Christ is among us. 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 Please join me in the litany of confession. Living God, you have placed the risen Christ in our midst. Our 
Living God, you have placed the risen Christ in our midst. Living God, you have placed the risen Christ in our midst. Living God, you have placed the risen Christ in our midst. Living God, you have placed the risen Christ in our midst. Hear now our silent prayers to you. Amen. Sisters and brothers, by the mercy of Christ, our sins are forgiven. Sing praises with an upright heart as we learn the ways of God. And thanks be God, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let us share the signs of peace of Christ with one another. And may the crease of Christ be with you. <laughs> you may be seated. Let us pray. Loving God, anoint us with your Holy Spirit as we hear your word this day. Fill us with your truth that we may walk in the ways of God and live to the glory of your realm. Amen. All of the scriptures today come from the New International Version. Reading from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And from the Gospel of John, chapter 13. From the chapter of John, from the Gospel of John, chapter 13. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And from Ephesians, the end of chapter 4 into chapter 5. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, 
but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it might benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Following God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. This is the word of the Lord. Permacrisis. Permacrisis. Multi permacrisis is a technical term that was coined just a year ago and was named the word of the year in the Collins Encyclopedia. Permacrisis, word of the year 2022. What is a permacrisis? Well, I know that. All of you know what it is because you all have felt it even though you may never have heard the word before. It's a term that perfectly embodies this dizzying sense of lurching from one unprecedented event to another as we wander bleakly from one horror in our world to the next horror in our world. In the 50s and 60s, we just had one horror. It was called duck and cover because a bomb's going to hit. That's not today. It's one of those things happening every 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, I had no idea what was going to happen this past week when I wrote this sermon title and wrote the sermon. But sure enough, another horrible crisis just occurred this wet past week when the very first president of the United States has been indicted. Unprecedented, it makes your stomach lurch. But there are many other permacrisis that I can bring to your attention that you already know, so excuse me and pardon me for being redundant. The permafrost in the North Countries is melting and the methane gas is going into the atmosphere. It's not going to get better much because the EPA was just ruled, overruled by the Supreme Court two weeks ago in the power of the EPA to do much. And we're having a lot of smoke coming in from Canada. And then we talk about economics. Beginning in 1981, our economic system bifurcated, and it continually grew now for the last uh, let's say 45 years, into a split economic world of those who have money and those who do not. Now, there's a third one. My wife's nephew, brilliant young lad, wanted to go off to college and he wanted to minor in the arts but major in engineering. So he checked all the Ivy League schools and as an engineer, you don't take art in an Ivy League school, but he wanted to play music and do some of the art. So he just graduated a couple of weeks ago from Duke, where they allow you to both study engineering and participate in the arts. Oh, well, politics. Of course, you, we won't talk about politics today at all, except to say that you hardly need to raise a subject and the world sort of explodes in your face. And what about public education? Would you like to be a teacher today in Florida or Tennessee or Texas where you really don't know whether the book you're teaching is allowed to be taught or you can't uh, read, well, that wonderful Harper Lee book? It's, it's something else. Well, there's another permacrisis. Hmm. If you don't think there's a permacrisis, I suggest you look at the news about southeastern Ohio where we have one of the highest suicide and drug death rates in the entire country. That's called a permacrisis. It's affecting our lives and making us somewhat bonkers. Of course, I haven't yet mentioned the pandemic. My best friend for many, many years died during the pandemic. And of course, as you know, uh, I've told you often enough, 
in the last eight years, I've had five stents put into my chest. Now that'll give you a sense of urgency if you never had one. And just this morning, I learned a new word myself. It's called singularity. Fantastic word. It means if you attach your mind into what is now called the intelligence world, that is automatic intelligence, the AI world, you can be communicated in singularity with peoples all over the world. We have a singularity of population now worldwide with AI status. All of those put together within the last 10 years when in September, when that wonderful pianist was playing the piano and I was playing my horn, I went suddenly deaf. Now is that enough to get you upset? It sure got me upset. Well, I want to talk about Goethe for a minute. Perhaps the greatest German writer and producer of the greatest German works ever. Goethe wrote his wonderful book, The Sorrows of Young Werther, when he was only about 20 years old. But he didn't write the best work ever to come out of Germany until he was 82 years old, and that book was called Faust. Well, another one. When Bryant Mays Kirkland was the pastor at the Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York City at the age of 55, he uh, put his application in to become the pastor of the National Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. His application was rejected because they said at the age of 55, he's too old. Well, he retired at the age of 75 from the Fifth Avenue Church and was doing some local interims, but then at the age of 82, the National Presbyterian Church called him and said, would you like to be our interim for a couple of years? He said, okay. So at the age of 82, like Goethe at the age of 82, Kirkland went to the National Presbyterian Church in Washington. There were more people in attendance after he got there than had ever attended the church before in its history. You know what that means? That means that I still have three and a half years of my life to say something important. I would love to say it's going to be today, but I highly doubt it. Oh, there is one thing I'd like to say. All of those items which I listed as permacrisis, the news media, in my opinion, have it wrong. The social media, in my opinion, they have it wrong. The permacrisis, if I am a Bible reader, the permacrisis in our world is the lack of love and the capacity to forgive. That is our permacrisis. It's not economics, it's not STEM, it's not drugs, it's not suicide, it's just that. I've been reading the web and I see that some young people in our church have won some prizes and I'm proud of that in, in athletics. My grandniece just won the national collegiate 5,000 meter long race. Pretty neat, I say. Got her a nice scholarship. But what is most important, and this is really grandparents, my six-year-old granddaughter won a prize. She has graduated from kindergarten. Now, she didn't just graduate from kindergarten. She got a plaque. My six-year-old granddaughter got a plaque for being the kindest kindergartner in the class. I think that's pretty cool. Because my son, when he graduated from the eighth grade middle school, he got two awards for being the kindest person in the class, one from his students and one from the faculty. Now what do I hope? I hope that my granddaughter will grow up and continue what her ministry is. Not building electric cars, not putting people on the moon, not sending people dips into the ocean, not discovering something in research science, but she will continue to grow in her capacity to be kind.
in her capacity to love. Every member of this congregation, I assume, I could be wrong, but I'm just going to assume that all of you know the major single line sentence in our church's mission statement. Come on, you all do, right? Number one statement, uh, come on Martha, I know you've got it. The transformation of people's lives by displaying the love of Jesus Christ transformation of people's lives by the act of Christian love. That's our mission. Now, I want to add uh, another permacrisis. And I'm going to add that, and it's painful. Another permacrisis is the bifurcation of the church. That is the right-wing evangelical church and the denominational churches, which have been more mainline. And I'm sad for this part because I just spent a few days with my oldest son to celebrate his 50th birthday. And this is my son talking to his 42 years in the ministry father. And he said to me, as we were sitting there in his living room, Christianity no longer has any meaning for me. Now that, that's an ouch. Uh, I learned about the word ouch playing euchre. When you beat somebody at euchre, that's an ouch. And if they beat you, that you get an ouch sign on the screen. It's an ouch. But why is he telling me that? He's saying that because the messages out of the churches are so convoluted. There's so much anger and, and, and hostility in the churches. It's become so disenfranchised from the real world that it simply no longer has any meaning. Ouch. Now, in this context, you and I may have that feeling when we're at home that there is not a whole lot we can do about any of those permacrisis. In the 50s and 60s, a century ago now, they called it nausea. Today we call it permacrisis. But I would like to suggest to you that there is a lot we can do, and I'm going to do it in a very brief contrast. My friends, we can either listen, we can either listen to Clint Eastwood or we can listen to Jesus the Christ. It's your choice and my choice. Now, Clint Eastwood had one really good movie called The Bridges of Madison County. Phenomenal movie, I loved it. But all of his other 999 movies were exactly the same exactly the same. And we'll start with his last major movie called The Unforgiven. If you haven't seen it, I'm not giving anything away if you know anything at all about Clint Eastwood. The Unforgiven, the movie, begins. He rides into town, the good old man with the heavy beard, dirty and hat, and his long leather coat, gets off his horse, goes into the barber shop. Now this is the first minute. He sits down in the barber shop and the barber covers him over with the barber's apron in order to give him a shave. And into the barber shop walk three nasty looking devils. Within two minutes, he shot and killed all three of them. Now, if you keep watching the movie after that, you have about an hour's worth of this kind of thing until the end of the movie. At the end of the movie, called The Unforgiven, all the nasty people in town have found their way to the local saloon. It's Dodge City, and he's there. They're all gathered. They all have their guns. They all look hostile. They all need a shave. They haven't bathed in 10 years. And Clint Eastwood comes into the swinging doors of the casino with all these 30 or 40 men inside. And believe it or not, with one six-gun holding six shots, he kills them all. It's an amazing thing to see. 
Clint Eastwood has been trying to make a Presbyterian point with all of his movies. They're all exactly the same, may take place in different forms, different venues, uh, but they're the same. An incapacity to forgive, an inability to love those who we would rather not love, ultimately ends in death, the death of our soul. Holding on to anger and holding on to hate without the capacity to forgive simply kills. And Clint Eastwood tries to make that as clear as possible. And then there's a brand new 2016 re-edition of The Magnificent Seven. Wow, I remember that from the 1960s. But the new edition is out, and it's also a story of the unforgiven and vengeful person. A woman hires seven men to come to her town and get rid of the man who killed her husband. It progresses with all these magnificent seven gunslingers coming into town, and lo and behold, at the end of the movie, there is a shot right down Main Street, and there you see 122 dead men, the unforgiven. We have these choices in our life, either Jesus Christ, love and forgiveness, or death of the soul. We sometimes think that we can't do much. We sometimes think the church is uh, gone, or like my 50-year-old son, Christianity simply no longer has a meaning. But I'm hoping now that out there in the netherworld, some teenager, 13 years old, will hear what I'm going to say, because in my opinion, it's absolutely phenomenal. I'm going to talk now just for a moment about the greatest miracle of the 20th century. It was critically important to me because I was the pastor of a becoming African-American Presbyterian church. And this incident happened during my tenure there, and it was a tearjerker. It was the time when the African National Congress took over South Africa and got rid of both. Well, the following Sunday, uh, you, you'll love this, Sue, the following Sunday after the capitulation of both and the white power in South Africa and the ANC took over, our worship service, so it's a black community, our worship service, we began with the Russian hymn. Ba, da, 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 da. You know, that wonderful old piece, you know. The second hymn. The German Austrian hymn, Deutschland, 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 Duber, a great German hymn. But how did we conclude the service? That's what's important. We stood and we sang the new South African national anthem, a well known United Methodist hymn, and the congregation was in tears. Now, what's the miracle? Everyone thought that when the African-American community, African community, would take over South Africa, there would be a massive bloodbath. Or there would be war trials, just like the Nuremberg trials. But lo and behold, the United Methodist Church, now get this, we're talking about churches. The United Methodist Church and the Roman Catholic Church had enough influence in South Africa, in the black community, that a miracle occurred. What is it? The ANC brought together what was to be called the Peace and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. Now get this. Any person who had committed any crime against the black African community, if they would come to that commission, confessed what they had done, and promised never to do it again, they were forgiven and set free. Do I need to say that again? Can you hear that? Wasn't the Nuremberg trials, it wasn't massive slaughter and retaliation, it was love and forgiveness. Think about it. Just think about it. And it was done through the power of the church. Now, a quick aside, 
I, I could preach on this, but I won't. Many of you may have different thoughts about why the wall fell in East Germany. But as you know, my family's from East Germany. The wall fell, if you were there talking to people, they'll tell you the reason the wall fell was because of the German Lutheran Church. The church has great power. And one of my great sympathies in this world today is what's happened to the denominational churches who are the one force in our culture. Where else are we taught love? Where else are we taught reconciliation? Where else are we taught forgiveness, if not in the denominational churches? I worry about it. But now, here's the question. In 2003, a wonderful book was written, a book that exceeds what Jimmy Carter said was the best book written in the 20th century, and that was Moral Man and Moral Society. But one of the members of that Peace and Reconciliation Commission, her name is Pumla. I'm not going to say her last name. It's way too long. Pumla wrote a book called A Human Being Died That Night, A Story of Forgiveness. There was a man who led all the security forces for white South Africa. His name was Eugene de Kuch. And Eugene de Kuch was in prison, and it was Pumla's job to go visit him and offer him forgiveness. He was called the Butcher of South Africa. He was called the Devil of South Africa. He was called the Evil One. And Pumla had the task of doing the interviews to see what he would do. I'm not going to tell you what happened. But I do want to tell you an interesting idea about forgiveness. When someone has knowingly committed an offense, a serious offense, they now know that they are on the outside of humanity, not on the inside of humanity. We lock them up. But let me do that again. If you've committed a serious offense, even a minor offense toward your friend, you know you're no longer inside that friend's relationship. You have been put outside the relationship. You've all experienced that, I'm sure. You've done something wrong, said something wrong, behaved in some wrong way, and because of that, you're no longer in communion with them. Well, here's what Pumla found out. The person who was the victim the victim of whatever this insult or crime or whatever it is, that person has extraordinary power. Because you have the power, and I have the power, to forgive the person who committed the act and allow them to come back into humanity. By forgiving them, we have power. We have power to enable them to reclaim a loving relationship with us. Tremendous power. The church had power in South Africa. The German Lutheran Church had power in East Germany. And I'm suggesting that you and I, in our daily relationships, have the power to change and put people back into the world of humanity. Now, I want to make a little fun time. All this permacrisis gets to me, gives me a headache, makes me dizzy, upsets my stomach, and I have a nervous breakdown. I take a pill for that. I'm sure many of you have a pill for that. When I first went to work for the FBI in 1962, I was only 17 years old, and I had to ride a bus to work. I'm not going to tell you where it is, but I will tell you if, uh, if you went to the uh, old post office building, which is now the new Trump Tower in Washington, D.C., that was the FBI headquarters at some time. So I went there on a bus, and I got on this bus, never been on a bus before. There was a rope, went from the door all the way back, right above the windows, and on this side there was a rope, went from the back all the way to the front. I went in the world, I had a clothesline hanging up there above the windows, I don't know what it was. So I'm on the bus, it's a local. A local means you stop about every block, but the bus driver won't stop unless you warn him to stop. So by golly, I saw people, I figured it out, you pull the rope, it goes buzz, buzz, the driver stops. 
What a wonderful thing, I thought. Little rope, I should get married, pull that. So my wife looked at me today when I fixed the microphone. Uh, I could pull the rope, she'd bring me tea. She would, but she'd pour it right over my head. Well, I learned that about this rope business. Now, it's 1970, November. There was a custom at that time, 50 years ago, that there was a Veterans Day parade down Fifth Avenue, and I was a flunky pastor at the church, the most prestigious church in the Presbyterian system, and Bryant Mays Kirkland was the pastor. Well, the parade comes down, all these big officers are carrying weapons, they stop right in front of the Presbyterian church at 55th and Fifth Avenue, they do a left face, whatever that is, they go up these massive steps, they take their guns and they stack them in the, in the entryway in the vestibule, and they come in and they have a place set for them, and lo and behold, the President of the United States comes in and worships. So you're expecting with that kind of crowd on Veterans Day that the man up there in the pulpit, by the way, he's 14 steps up into that pulpit, brilliant man, known throughout the country, you think he's going to say something really powerful and important, but you're in New York City. You never know what's going to happen. You got 10 million people living there and you feel absolutely incompetent to do anything. Who are you? You're a nothing. Uh, three, four, five thousand people in there, but 10 million, what can you do? You're pretty well lost. Uh, not much you can do. So here we have Brad Kirkland up there in the pulpit, this host of people sitting out there, and Dr. Kirkland ends his sermon. I'll never forget the end of his sermon. I hope you never forget this either. Um, this, is, this is called a pregnant pause. I don't know what that means, but a pregnant pause. So you kind of get ready for the big line. This is a punchline. Now, my punchline at the age of 78 and a half was, know the church mission statement. Not Brad Kirkland. He's up there. You got to look up to see him. Here's his concluding line. You ready? You ready for this? I, just for him. I'm agitating him all morning. When you get off the bus, you do not need to play a symphony. Do you get it? You wouldn't believe how agitating it is to be on a bus with some idiot that thinks he has to play the timpanis by pulling that rope in order to get the bus driver to stop. I'll give you an idea what that's like. <laughs> the idiots, they won't quit. No, you don't need to play a symphony. Just go, Beep! and the driver hears it and stops. What's the point? The point is, even in a city of 10 million people, Little tiny acts of love and sensitivity and compassion make a big difference. Particularly when I'm on my way home from work and I just want a little peace and quiet. So, 78 and a half years old. One, know your church mission statement. Our purpose as a congregation is to help people transform their lives through the love of Jesus Christ. And the second, no matter how small you may feel, you simply can make the world a better place by just giving one little tap on the rope to ask the driver to stop. Amen. Now, would you stand and affirm your faith? And we're going to talk specifically about transformation and reconciliation. This is from the church in that aforesaid country. We believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who gathers, protects, and cares for the church through word and spirit. This God has done since the beginning of the world and will do to the end. We believe that Christ's work of reconciliation is made manifest in the church as a community of believers who have been reconciled with God and with one another. That unity is, therefore, both a gift and an obligation for the Church of Jesus Christ. That this unity of the people of God 
must be manifested and be active in a variety of ways. In that we love one another, that we experience, practice, and purse a community with one another, that we are obligated to give ourselves willingly and joyfully to be of benefit and blessing to one another. Jesus is Lord to the one and only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us stand and sing to him. Seated. As some of you know, I'm uh, rather particular about 
encouraging individuals to find their own space and their own place in their prayer life. In every wedding that I was privileged to perform, I would ask the couple to a place in their home somewhere, a sacred space. I didn't care where it was, I didn't care what it was, I didn't care how it was, but somewhere as they were building a new home together to find a sacred space. What I also know is almost everyone has a place out there in the universe that's sacred. Back in 1988, when my father died, I went to my sacred space. We had a big old farm, and way down in the valley there was a creek and a little falls, not more than three or four feet high. And that's where I played as a little boy, down in that valley, by that water, with the falls and a little tree. That's where I go. Some of you may go to the ocean. Some of you may go to a mountaintop. Some of you may go to the kitchen sink. Uh, that's your space. But I invite you now to go to your place for our time in prayer together. Let us pray. God, you are gracious to us. You give us places where we can be still and know that you are God. There is a place of quiet rest. There is a place where waters are still and the grass is green. There are places where the sounds of the ocean murmur us. God, we are filled in our space today with thanksgiving. For there were 30 and 40 little children, a baby, and the oldest a 12-year-old, lost in the jungle. A plane crash. Only children live. And by an, just an extraordinary, amazing gift of grace, all the children were rescued alive. We give you thanks, O oh God, for moments in our lives that hold us together when we feel like we're breaking apart. And there was the little boy, only five years old, with a splinter in his finger. And for him, it was the end of the world. And the pain was excruciating and he was screaming, and it was only a tiny splinter to his mom. But she heard his terror in his heart, and she sat him down, and she held his hand, and she removed the little splinter, and he was at peace. Holy God, so many of us have a splinter in our soul. We pray that you will sit us down, hold our hand, and take the splinter out, that we might be whole, fulfilled, and at peace. And today we pray especially for some very wonderful people whom we know right here in our own sanctuary. We pray especially for caregivers. We pray that you will hold their hand and make us love givers to them and to their family. We pray, O oh God, for those who would prefer no longer to be alive, that somehow we might find ways to give them life that has meaning and purpose. For we have some of those also among us. We have 
members, O oh God, who are hurting because supposedly they weren't born right or they chose wrong and they hurt. They hurt because of our exclusions, the most terrible world in the dictionary, exclusion. We pray, O oh God, that you'll help each one of us through the transforming love of Jesus Christ, make them feel that they are also a part of our humanity and they belong. We pray, O oh God, for Donald Trump. We pray for his world, his family, his wife, his children. We pray for those around him who care for him. And we pray for our country in great turmoil. We pray we might, might find reconciliation and resolution and peace and that historic justice might come about in forgiving ways. And now, O oh God, hear us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I don't know of any euphemisms to talk about money except the word money. And it's money time. It's also a couple of announcements time. After 21 days, it's supposed to rain in the next couple of hours. Hopefully, very wet rain. Because of that, the choirs and handbell folk who are going to go to Sue's house for a party, you're going to be coming here to the church house uh, at 4.30 for a music party. And uh, hope that goes well. Now Sue is going to play for us this grand piece of Handel's music, uh, Peace Abiding.
Wonderful God, we give you thanks for all the gifts of this creation. And especially we pray that you will bless the gifts given here today, that they might be a part of the building of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the hymn. I, this is my favorite hymn. It's in the key of G. It's in a low voice. And I have asked the men of the choir, who are our ushers today, to make sure that they sing boldly. The Old Testament does not say we must sing wonderfully and beautifully. The Old Testament says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. So even if you can't carry a pitch, you're invited to make a joyful noise unto the Lord with this phenomenal piece of music, O oh, love that will not let me go. In the Apostle Paul's seven different letters in the New Testament to the people at Ephesus and Corinth, and he admonishes them over and over again with these words, that we are to go out into the world as peacekeepers, holding on to only those things that are good, never returning to anyone evil for evil. Rather, we are to strengthen the faint-hearted, carry the weak, and in so doing, the God who created us, the God who continuously picks us up when we have fallen, that God will be with you now and forevermore. Go in peace. Now, we're going to do this wonderful song for the benediction. All of you know it. And again, you're asked to sing boldly. It's a wonderful threefold amen. <laughs> 